Okay, we're going to begin. Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, for, I think, one of uh, our first event in person in, in a very long time. Uh, my name is Marion Fourcade, and I am uh, the director of uh, UC Berkeley Social Science Matrix. And it's a really a pleasure to welcome you all for the Matrix Distinguished Lecture. The Problem of Trust in the Digital Public Sphere by Professor William Davis. So we are very pleased uh, to present this event uh, with our co-sponsors from here at Berkeley, the Institute of European Studies, the Network for a New Political Economy, and the Center for British Studies. Now, before we begin, I'd like to take a minute to tell you about some other events that we have coming up this semester at Matrix. Next week, uh, on March uh, 2nd, we are joining forces with the Clausen Center for an online panel on cryptography and the future of money. The panel features a remarkable list of speakers, uh, including Marcus Brunemeyer from Princeton, Stephen Eich from Georgetown, Christine Paulo at, from um, Berkeley, and also our very own Barry Eichengreen as moderator. On March 7th, we have a book panel uh, in our Author Meets Critics series. Professor Martha Wilford will present her recent book, Pre-Colonial Legacies in Post-Colonial Politics, Representation and Redistribution in Decentralized West Africa. And she will be in conversation with uh, two colleagues from Berkeley and Stanford. And finally, uh, on April 4, we will be presenting an online panel on the social and economic impacts of fire as part of our California Spotlight series. So there's much more. You can all find it, uh, you find it all on our website and uh, you, know, you can sign up for our newsletter. Now, all right, and now for the main event. Without further ado, uh, it is my great honor to welcome our 2022 Matrix Distinguished Lecturer, William Davis. So Will uh, is Professor of Political Economy at Goldsmiths, University of London, and co-director of the Political Economy Research Center. Uh, he's a really a prolific writer, political economist, and sociological theorist. Uh, Professor Davis's work covers a very wide range of issues of pressing relevance today. This is why you know, we thought he was the perfect matrix lecturer, interdisciplinary, public-oriented, and thinking big. So I'll just mention a few uh, recent books, all of which are really fantastic reads, very elegant and you know, extremely compelling. Uh, in fact, the list of endorsements and enthusiastic reviews you know, on any one of those we, would make really the most accomplished academic blush. But you have like for every single book, you have those. So it's remarkable. So The Limits of Neoliberalism, Authority, Sovereignty, and the Logic of Competition, published in 2014, explores the reshaping of all social institutions through uh, economic technique and the pervasive deployment of the language of competition. Published a year later in 2015, we have The Happiness Industry, How Government and Big Business Sold Us Wellbeing, which looks at the uses of big data and positive psychology in business and management. Uh, in 2018, Nervous States, I saw a copy down there. Yes, thank you, Brian. And uh, Democracy and the Decline of Reason, uh, described as a masterpiece by the New York Times. This book offers a deep dive into the fractious consequences of our reliance on social media over expertise and feeling over fact. Um, in 2021, Professor Davis published This Is Not Normal, The Collapse of Liberal Britain, which analyzes the political tumult of the UK in recent years, including uh, post, uh, you know, with Brexit and post Brexit. And finally, I'll just mention the soon to be published and co-authored unprecedented how COVID-19 revealed the politics of our economy, uh, which explores the pandemic through the lens of the transformation of work, government, social reproduction and learning. Now, you may also have come across Professor Davis is writing elsewhere in The Guardian, The New Left Review, The London Review of Books. It was a fantastic piece uh, yesterday or the day before. Yeah, this week, really, truly uh, on, on uh, education during the pandemic. The New Republic, The Atlantic, The New York Times, and many others. Um, you know, whether the, lo whether the longer or the shorter pieces, I always find something to learn. So thank you so much for being here. We're excited to hear you. And the floor is yours. Thanks. 
Thank you. I, I feel like I can only go downhill from there. That was a, a very generous introduction. Thank you so much, Marin. And um, thank you so much for this um, wonderful invitation. Um, it's kind of a cliche to start these things by saying what a privilege it is to be invited. But on this occasion, truly, uh, I was uh, very uh, honored to receive the invitation to come to Berkeley and to the uh, Matrix um, Institute to uh, give a talk about some of my work. Um, Marion has already um, alluded to some of the concerns of my work and also warned you that it tends to be quite expansive, it tends to be quite interdisciplinary. Today I'm going to wander between uh, issues of the history of ideas, uh, the sociology of quantification and certain aspects of uh, science and technology studies. Um, I'm going to draw on some of the writing that I've done, uh, some of which was for, for general audiences, that, that book um, this is not normal was actually a collection of essays in places like the London View of Books and the Guardian. Um, but um, I'm going to draw on some of the themes in, in that collection of work over the last five or six years, which I guess comes from a, a I suppose, a, a basic uh, feeling that maybe some of you can relate to that on some level, liberalism has had it coming for quite some time. Uh, but on another level, uh, there is a danger of throwing uh, the, the baby out with the bathwater and what are the, some of the threats that are opposed to uh, aspects of liberal institutions and the possibilities of, uh, of, 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 of if any kind of effective government uh, in an age that is disrupted by some of the uh, forces that I describe in some of those books and which I'm going to uh, talk about today. So um, let me... Um, uh, just uh, get going. So liberal democracies have suffered an apparent trust crisis for almost as long as anyone can remember. Many surveys of trust in government show a significant decline since the 1960s, especially pronounced in the case of uh, countries such as the United States. I'm sure uh, you've all seen these sorts of charts before. Here is a similar chart uh, for the UK showing how the proportion of people who say they almost never trust the government is now at over a, th uh, a third. Trust in the media demonstrates a parallel decline. Here is a chart again from the United States with the particular quirk in the United States that uh, there is this bifurcation by party since the 1990s with trust of Democratic voters holding up reasonably well while trust of Republicans has tended to carry on falling. But of course, trust has not evaporated in every sense. Around the world, the regular surveys on the question most people can be trusted show considerable variations by national context, but no precipitous decline. If you look at trust across different professions, you see examples such as this from the UK, where trust in health professionals, scientists, teachers, judges, um, where trust in health professionals, scientists, teachers and judges are at very high levels. The problem, unsurprisingly, is the identity of those professions at the bottom of the slide. A study carried out in France found that the experience of unemployment made people less inclined to trust government, but more inclined to trust the police. We need to be careful about viewing trust as a good in itself. After all, there may be excellent reasons why people's trust in government and politicians has fallen. There is nothing noble about high levels of trust in people who lie or mistreat you. Nevertheless, there are various reasons why an absence of trust might be a problem for the basic functioning of government and democracy. On a simple policy level, this problem of trust has recently reappeared in the context of COVID. A recent study published in The Lancet found that trust in government and in other people correlated more closely with lower infection levels and higher vaccination rates than any other indicator they could find. There are, of course, questions here about the direction of causality, as trust in governments such as the US appears to have fallen steadily over the course of the pandemic as the failure to deal with it has um, been prolonged. There's also uh, this study uh, recently published in the UK uh, showing how um, uh, skepticism towards vaccines correlates specifically to uh, low levels of trust and high levels of reliance on uh, platforms such as YouTube, perhaps unsurprisingly. And in the past six years, the trust crisis has supposedly become radicalized into something more serious, a truth crisis enabled by a combination of unscrupulous insurgent political campaigns and digital platforms that are uniquely equipped to circulate and target disinformation and emotive content. The spectre of artificial intelligence capable of generating so-called deep fakes fans the flames of this epistemological panic that truth itself is in peril or already dead. Now, to avoid resorting to this kind of panic, we need to think as clearly as possible about what kind of crisis we're witnessing. 
In the first instance, it's worth reflecting on the fact that it is journalists, politicians, and government which have become viewed with such suspicion, especially on the right, which then breeds other forms of doubt. For instance, surveys show that statistical agencies across Europe are generally viewed as trustworthy, but the credibility of their numbers immediately falls when they are being reported by journalists or politicians. Britain has elected an already discredited journalist as its prime minister with fairly predictable results. The problem is that in liberal democracies, journalists and politicians both perform a pivotal representational role on which representation, representative democracy and the liberal public sphere has been built since the 18th century. This representational role is at once political and epistemological. It is the capacity to serve as some kind of mirror to society, whether it be in the form of a parliament or a newspaper that reflects society back to itself. In the more hubristic visions of the liberal public sphere, as celebrated by Jürgen Habermas, the free exchange of ideas would generate a form of emergent public opinion that spoke for everyone. Habermas himself believed that this went into decline with the rise of corporate capitalism in the late 19th century, but it now appears utterly broken or at least somewhat powerless. It is absolutely right that we think through epistemological and political crises simultaneously, but I want to approach this from one particular angle today to consider the implications of a shift from a society that at least in its self image or ideology privileges facts as bearers of truth to one that in its self image or ideology privileges data as the bearers of truth. And let me just briefly clarify what I mean by this. So take these two uh, numerical displays, both integral to contemporary capitalism, a company report on the left containing its accounts and a Bloomberg terminal, the screen through which over 30, 300,000 financial services professionals do their jobs and encounter the market. There are a number of obvious differences between the two. Most obviously one is on paper and therefore a static representation that holds true until the next report comes along at some predetermined date. And the other is a dynamic display. The former is designed specifically for public readers of any kind, investors, but also journalists, academics, trade unions, and the general reader. It is an example of what Mary Poovey refers to as the modern fact, an item of knowledge that is configured specifically to circulate among strangers and remain credible, regardless of the character of who is in possession of it. Facts of this kind are implicitly offered in the form of a public promise, this is our financial balance of assets and liabilities, I promise you. The screen, on the other hand, is configured in such a way as to put the user in real-time contact with the markets. There are also things like rolling news in the top right-hand corner. Users can set it up in whichever way suits them personally, adding more screens and so on. Like an aeroplane cockpit or car dashboard, the entire design and aesthetic is tailored around the affordances of human sensory organs, eyes, ears, touch with a view to alerting the user to whatever needs attending to from one moment to the next. This is a machine dedicated to the provision of data in the literal sense of that which is given to the human senses to provoke some kind of reaction. I certainly wouldn't suggest that the data uh, on these screens is not accurate, but the point I want to get across is that the aim of these displays is not to achieve public credibility as a promise, like a fact, but to facilitate some kind of competitive advantage or avert competitive disadvantage. The purpose is therefore to overcome friction and extract signals from noise, terms that derive from problems of military strategy and logistics. And I just wanna stress uh, before I go on that uh, my analysis of these different formats of knowledge is uh, somewhat ideal typical in the, in the Weberian sense, uh, in that I want to tease out the different uh, imminent principles um, that are at stake in how knowledge and numbers are shared and not act, hopefully not uh, turn this into some kind of uh, technological uh, determinism. Now, the kinds of problems and questions I'm pointing to and which preoccupy many liberal democracies today are ones that run the whole way back to the origins of liberal political theory, arguably the origins of the modern state. Nowhere does one encounter modern and contemporary anxieties indeed even surrounding the politics of trust more acutely than in the work of Thomas Hobbes typically viewed as the entry point to modern political theory. It's in Hobbes's work that one can see how the problems of epistemic and political authority are entangled in numerous and complicated ways. And I wouldn't uh, offer a kind of full praise of Hobbes's argument in Leviathan, and I imagine the, the rudiments of that are familiar uh, to um, many, if not all of you, but I do want to highlight a, a few elements. 
Hobbes famously argued that in the absence of an all-powerful state which created the conditions of civil society, violence would ensue, escalating into a war of all against all. But it's important to remember some of the anthropological conditions of this. As a rationalist, Hobbes was very optimistic regarding the capacities of the human mind to identify the laws of nature via mathematical reasoning with complete certainty. But he was deeply fearful of human fallibility on at least three counts, which uh, I summarize, if you'll forgive the slightly crude summary on this slide here. Firstly, that human senses are liable to mislead. Uh, think of uh, Descartes' experience of noticing that a stick was bending when put into water and realizing that although he knew the stick was still straight, his eyes deceived him into thinking that it was bent. This is what we might call the danger of empiricism. Secondly, human beings are vain and boastful and trust their own impressions of the world more highly than others, because after all, they are uh, the ones that I've had. It's my experience. I know what I, I saw. I know what I feel. This is what we might call the danger of hubris. Thirdly, human beings are rhetoricians. They uh, say all sorts of things to impress one another or persuade one another. But as a result, words cease to be, dependable, cease to be a dependable basis for trust between people. This is what we might call the danger of rhetoric. And as uh, Hobbes famously wrote, words are wise men's counters. They do but reckon by them, but they are the money of fools. We shouldn't bank on the words of one another. Thus, when confronting one another in the state of nature, no matter how honest and knowledgeable a person may be, they have no means of convincing others of this, nor any dependable means of knowing how honest and knowledgeable others are either. There is a crucial, and this is important to the argument I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and make, there is a crucial temporal element here. It may be that in the absence of violence, there are ways of demonstrating one's honesty, providing evidence, offering reasons, but these take time and require the confidence that violence is absent. If the possibility of violence remains present, and um, you see that as far as Hobbes was concerned, uh, the, merely imagining that violence might be a possibility is already to enter a state of, uh, a state of nature for Hobbes. Then if the possibility of violence remains present, um, time for deliberation and reasoning disappears because it becomes rational to act violently in self-defense. Thus, as thinkers such as Paul Virilio have argued, violence or war is a kind of accelerant that squeezes out the intervals and interruptions on which deliberation and reason depend. Unless some higher or powerful third party has been established to enact and enforce laws to eliminate violence, no other form of economic or scientific progress is possible. The problems of truth and of politics find their resolution in a famous triangle of promise-making and trust. The sovereign promises to keep people safe from one another, the people promise to obey the sovereign, and on that basis, people can come to make and accept promises to one another as merchants, scientists, creditors, members of civil society. On these conditions, Hobbes was very optimistic about possibilities for commercial society, scientific inquiry, and the nascent field of political economy. But only on these conditions, the credibility of scientific knowledge was guaranteed by the credibility of the state. The later years of Hobbes' life witnessed a flowering of various institutions that sociologists have viewed as constitutive of social, political, and economic modernity. In the top left, the Lloyds of London insurance market began to operate in Lloyds coffee shop from around 1648 onwards, deploying mathematical techniques of risk modeling and accounting techniques of bookkeeping to underwrite ships. In the top right, the Royal Society was founded in 1660 by Robert Boyle, effectively as a private members club, where natural philosophers or scientists, as we now call them, could share scientific research and conduct experiments in front of one another. Pioneering forms of statistics were being collected and analyzed by the likes of William Petty and John Graunt during the 1660s, some of which they presented at the Royal Society. Graunt's analysis of the bills of mortality in the, in the bottom right was a key moment in the formation of modern demography and epidemiology. And in 1696, the world's first central bank was founded in London to serve as an intermediary between the monarch and the financial markets that purchased government bonds. Those bonds, in turn, represented the origin of modern fiat money, in which the value of bills depended entirely on the trust of merchants in the state. These were all, in different ways, institutions built around the material affordances of paper, underwriting of insurers, treasury paper, scientific papers, statistical tables on paper. The materiality of paper allows for words to be lifted out of the flow of experience and granted a degree of permanence. 
And they were all in different ways dedicated to the collection and organization of facts understood as in Mary Poovey's account as a distinctive epistemic artifact whose credibility is retained regardless of context or individual virtue. The combination of mathematical models and standardized data collection allowed for a whole new way of representing social and economic life inspired by the scientific revolution that constituted what Foucault would term governmentality. Hobbes himself was a great enthusiast for the application of mathematical principles to the study of nature and society, but he was also deeply skeptical about some of these developments, in particular about the Royal Society, as uh, anyone knows the um, Leviathan and the Air Pump by Schaffer and Shapin, a wonderful book about, about that dispute. Hobbes's fear was that by secluding themselves in these members only environments, this new generation of natural philosophers and political economists were laying claims to epistemic sovereignty that challenged the political sovereignty of the state. This risked modern science developing into another form of sect, like the Aristotelian theologians or schoolmen, as, as Hobbes would have called them, which he accused of fanning the flames of religious conflict over the first half of the 17th century. And Hobbes was right in many ways. The, the rise of modern expertise offered a parallel set of solutions to the anthropological problems that Hobbes believed led to, uh, uh, led to violence. Firstly, the problem of, of the unreliability of the human senses would be overcome through the introduction of instruments, gauges, measures, optical devices, standards. Secondly, the danger of hubris was directly challenged with a set of norms in institutions such as the Royal Society, insisting on never doubting another man's word, always treating them as a gentleman, never boasting. This norm uh, continues in, in, in the, the UK's uh, parliament where it, you're not allowed to call someone uh, a liar. There are these strict rules against, uh, against this. Um, and thirdly, quantification uh, 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 and an exaggerated, re re exaggerated rhetoric of exactitude and precision would be deployed to try and dampen the passions and poetry of language, even to the point of speaking in numbers where no reliable numbers actually existed. It was out of these very same networks, clubs, and markets that there developed the practices and norms that Habermas identified as constituting the new bourgeois public sphere, whose defining quality was the empirical, aesthetic, or moral claims would be judged not on the status of the speaker, but on the validity of the claims themselves. It was thanks to the co-emergence of modern financial markets and scientific communities, both operating internationally, that a new form of discourse could develop, which was in principle oblivious to status or honor, but based, uh, but based around critique and the competitive quest for recognition amongst strangers. Equally from it would develop a critical perspective on the state, so-called public opinion, which had existed in parallel to. Much enlightenment optimism derived from the hope that with the rise of an autonomous public sphere, Hobbes was proved wrong in some way, that competitive, that commerce, reason, sympathy, civil society might be self-grounded. Implicit in this bourgeois public sphere were certain political and epistemological principles, which would later encounter legitimacy crises. Firstly, there was an implicit assumption that the public sphere does not include everyone. Only certain types of individual, only certain types of body were admitted, the white male property owner who myopically imagined themselves representing humanity. This is one grounds on which liberalism is attacked from both the left, but increasingly also the right, who specifically target the educational and cultural privileges associated with membership of such an elite. Secondly, there is a privileging of a certain kind of epistemic stance, namely an optical one that privileges distance. This is an image of uh, the Spectator magazine that was uh, published alongside the Spectator coffee house. And this metaphor of the Spectator, I think, is significant for uh, assuming that there is this kind of distance from politics where one can act as a kind of critic and a formation former of public opinion. And so liberalism was born and grew through to the late 19th century in a state of ambivalence regarding the grounds of trust. To what extent were promises credible because of the all powerful legal sovereign state hovering in the background? And to what extent were promises credible because of the norms, pieces of paper and institutions that the bourgeoisie had established to achieve a state of apparent political autonomy? In a sense, the success and the delusions of liberalism depended on this question never being fully answered and a productive ambiguity being sustained. Trust in the state and trust in expert knowledge are not reducible to one another, but nor do they exist wholly independently of one another as the experience of the pandemic has shown. And there is a more recent dimension to this, 
which I think is crucial for thinking through the political and epistemic crises of recent years that liberalism has, has uh, currently suffered, which is the work of the 20th century liberals or neoliberals to try and revive the project. A great deal has been written about the neoliberal thought collective in recent years, but here I want to characterize the neoliberal project in one particular way, which I think represents a different means of dealing with the ambivalence I just referred to of sovereign authority and expert authority. And that is that on a number of fronts, the neoliberals, especially the, the American neoliberals, effected a collapse of sovereignty and expertise into a single ontological domain of power. This can be witnessed, this collapse can be witnessed in both directions, uh, maybe not quite simultaneously, but uh, um, the, in ways that have, have sort of occurred in an overlapping ways. Firstly, sovereign power uh, for the neoliberals should be rationalized, economized, and reduced to its empirical effects. Nowhere is this clearer than in the Chicago School Law and Economics tradition. Of, uh, there's uh, Aaron Director, Edward Levy, and Robert Bork, but more recently people like Richard Posner and others, which revolutionized antitrust and regulation in the US and then later in, in, in Europe from the 1970s onwards, greatly to the benefit of monopoly capital. This is a resolutely anti-metaphysical, anti-state epistemology that effectively measures all forms of authority in terms of economic efficiency. Their hero is not Adam Smith, but Jeremy Bentham. And by the 1990s, they appeared to have got roughly what they wanted. States seem to have been reduced to the status of pure administration, management, and governance, um, as described by Wendy Brown in Undoing the Demos. But secondly, technocrats acquired a kind of sovereignty exerted via the financial system. This was initially apparent on an international scale in the form of the Washington Consensus from the mid-1980s onwards, which used loan conditionality to intervene in the operations of domestic economies in the global south. But after 2008, this extra democratic financial sovereignty in a sense came home as central banks became the supreme agents of economic policymaking, though in an anti-austerity guise, regulating the financial system, injecting liquidity into banks, buying treasury debts, um, and all of this obviously escalated hugely in 2020 during the pandemic. So under neoliberalism, while politicians become mere bureaucrats, economists become these kinds of leviathans. This fusion of sovereign and epistemic authority is arguably at the heart of liberalism's recent crises, fueling the rebellions against it. This image shows a famous and controversial campaign bus from the UK 2016 referendum on Brexit belonging to the Vote Leave campaign. Remain supporters were infuriated that the figure of 350 million pounds a week wasn't accurate. It discounted the amount of money received in return and believed this was precisely the form of post-truth activity that was breaking basic rules of civil society. You can imagine the kind of outrage. The efficacy of the message, of course, lay first in the fact that it contained an emotively rich image, the uh, National Health Service logo, the blue logo there. But secondly, the fact that Vote Leave appealed precisely to people who had given up listening to politicians spouting statistics. The vicious circle of statistical rhetoric in an anti-political age is that politicians reach for numbers to shore up their waning authority, but rather than find their authority bolstered, they simply reduce the credibility of the numbers they use. Vote Leave understood this and saw there was really nothing to be gained or lost from using statistics in the right or the wrong way. A second dimension of this crisis, it seems, though the connections I think are, we can, we can dis debate, is that as sovereign power and expertise dissolve into one another, that is where the state becomes reduced to governance and technocrats are elevated to the status of these quasi-sovereigns, that trust in the state has at the same time come to depend increasingly on having gone to university. This chart is from Thomas Piketty's uh, recent work. Um, it forms quite a major part of his uh, book, Capital and Ideology, and his analysis of what he calls the Brahmin left. Um, it shows a trend that is common to several liberal democracies, there's just three here, but in which graduates vote increasingly for liberal left parties and liberal left parties become increasingly dependent on graduates. The belief that government in inverted commas, can fix social problems has become a feature of, of education. This in turn enables conservatives to play various culture war cards in which universities are always implicated with which we're all far too familiar already. So the legitimacy crises of contemporary liberalism arguably uh, confirm aspects of Hobbes's fear about expertise, parceling off epistemic authority, cloistering it in exclusive clubs, ultimately generates a crisis 
of political sovereignty. The elevation of technocrats blurring the division between legal and empirical authority produces a sense that sovereignty has been lost altogether and the revival of often vicious nationalist sovereignist discourses promising to put power back where it historically belongs. I want to now turn back to this comparison and to the phenomenon of real-time data as represented by the second of the two numerical displays I briefly discussed earlier, the one on the right. If liberalism can be seen as a series of answers to the problem of trust, generating ambiguous entanglements of legal sovereignty and paper-based promises, into what type of political program does the idealization of real-time data fit? What anthropological problem is data an answer to? What is the function of numbers if not to support agreement between strangers as it was uh, for those uh, societies of the uh, late 17th century? And what can we say about a public sphere, if indeed it is a public sphere, in which screens such as this are the pivotal mediating device rather than paper? Evidently, a crucial attribute of such displays is that they promise constant and intimate contact with a fast moving world. To do this, they don't promise to discipline the senses as a statistical table or measuring device does, but on the contrary, to augment and steer them as sensory prosthetics. The aesthetics of the interface are crucial and may even be supplemented with haptics for a more immersive experience. If the purpose of the paper report or table is to interrupt the flow of experience, to produce a pause in which trust and consensus might be established, at, at least on its own terms, I should say, um, the purpose of real -time, the real-time interface is precisely the opposite, to eradicate the delay separating sensation and reaction to shrink political time. We might say, therefore, that if facts are an answer to the problem of trust, data is an answer to the problem of friction. They perform opposing functions in our relationship to time. A brief genealogy of real-time data technologies indicates that the initial impetus for their design and implementation lies in conflict situations where objective facts are scarce, threats are existential, and there is a premium on rapid decision-making. In the first instance, as Hobbes himself would have understood, this means war. The figure who first addressed the problem of friction in warfare, where that the concept of friction uh, comes from, was in many ways the anti-Hobbes, uh, Karl von Clausewitz, a devoted Prussian soldier and trained philosopher who was dazzled by the unprecedented achievements of Napoleon. As Clausewitz famously wrote in On War, everything in war is simple, but the simplest thing is difficult. Military plans are simple in theory, but are invariably impacted by contingencies or friction, which slow them down with potentially lethal consequences. Friction is, uh, to quote Clausewitz, the concept that differentiates actual war from war on paper, and uh, note the denigration of paper. Clausewitz might therefore be read as one of the first thinkers on the nature of real-time information and decision-making where everything is in constant flux. Dealing with and minimizing friction requires a distinctive set of epistemic and political capabilities that are entirely unlike those privileged by liberal institutions. Firstly, it involves carefully honed sensory awareness amidst the chaos and contingency of war. Clausewitz wrote of great military leaders that they possess a skilled intelligence to scent out the truth. In this metaphor of scenting, we can see an intriguing shift from an optical ideal of knowledge, that of the spectator, to an uh, olfactive ideal, I think that's the right word, associated with, of the nose, uh, associated with navigation, think of the phrase to follow your nose. If we follow the epistemic implications of scenting, it implies instant recognition and certainty on the basis of proximity, very unlike conventional ideas of, say, witnessing. Um, I, I, don't, I assume there's probably been a court case at some point where the question of someone recognizing something by smell has proved crucial in, in, in the outcome, but it would be an interesting one to, to, to think about in terms of the sort of, um, sort of public epistemology of, of, of whether that would be uh, possible or not. Uh, this is an ideal of raw data, something that far more closely captures the epistemic pitch of the data analytics industry than optical metaphors of observation, possibly even more accurately than the, the notion of the panopticon that is so important to someone like Foucault. Secondly, it requires a supreme inner self-belief on the part of the decision maker whose courage becomes an epistemic resource in the absence of established facts. 
This is precisely the hubris that Hobbes believed was so dangerous and one that, as we can see in our current political landscape, has the capacity to overwhelm fact-based discourses. Political and epistemic authority in situations of conflict does not consist in the ability to represent, but to navigate and to lead. Not for nothing does Twitter offer you the opportunity to follow people. <laughs> to follow is not necessarily to believe. As we know, there are plenty of popular leaders who are known liars, and we shouldn't necessarily assume that their followers are naive of that fact. Nevertheless, following doesn't necessarily imply uh, uh, credulity. And thirdly, friction sees epistemological problems merge with logistical ones of how to physically transmit, receive, and process information at speed. The sensory and cognitive capacities of the decision maker must be augmented, accelerated and extended through technologies of telecommunication and detection. And it is here that paper loses its political primacy and modern information technologies are born. It is no longer enough for an item of knowledge to be credible. It must also reach its destination intact, in time and in a form that supports rapid response, like the Bloomberg terminal. This also represents and embrace perhaps of what social theorists would later identify as post-representational or performative knowledge in which language becomes a deliberate means of acting on the world rather than seeking to mirror it. Amongst the various innovations exploited by Napoleon was the Chape Telegraph from the um, recognized as the first modern telecommunications network initiated in the early 1790s, which had by the middle of the 19th century created networks running the length and breadth of France. Yet this challenge which became acute with the birth of modern long distance international warfare of how to accelerate the movement of information would soon reappear in the economic domain thanks to the birth spread and dangers of the railroads. As James Benninger describes in the control revolution, economies such as the United States encountered a crisis of control in the, in the middle decades of the 19th century as goods were suddenly traveling at much higher speeds over much longer distances than people. Aside from the risk of train crashes, which arose from an inability to communicate at commensurate speeds and distances. This produced considerable uncertainty for investors and producers who struggled to stay abreast of what was happening in their own markets. Newspapers, magazines, and market research supplied some of the solution, but there was an urgent need for real-time data of the sort that was soon provided by telegraph transmitters, as seen on the left uh, here, uh, later developed into early stock tickers for communicating stock prices as seen on the right. The birth of aviation and ballistic missiles in the 20th century spawned the kinds of screen interfaces that we now all habitually carry around in our pockets and which now mediate everything from news to work and from social gossip to cultural exchange. The penetration of these technologies into the capillaries of our civic, democratic, social, personal and cultural lives over the past three decades has generated all manner of disruptions helping to escalate uh, and amplify various conflicts of various kinds. They've enabled the deliberate disruption of established institutions and services by platform-based companies operating according to the Klaus Witzian logic that friction must be minimized uh, at every turn. Uh, so this was I, this was something I found. I saw this. I was looking at Twitter this morning at the uh, terrible uh, news coming from Ukraine, and this was an example of uh, the elimination of uh, friction from the world of journalism. This was a tweet from a CNBC foreign affairs um, uh, uh, reporter saying that Russian forces uh, they've destroyed the nuclear waste storage facility. Here is a British newspaper, The Independent, um, which has been sorely underfunded for a long time and God knows exactly who is responsible for taking for putting that there and then sure enough um, this tweet came along not long afterwards but the independent is actually a, a sort of professional newspaper staffed by journalists and you can sort of see this is a, a kind of an example of how the famous kind of fog of war into into plays with and I'm sure we've all seen similar kinds of examples in recent years of how underfunded um, uh, media outlets, uh, social media, and conflicts um, uh, produce these sorts of outcomes. Um, in certain respects, this is registered in a simple acceleration of classically liberal institutions, such as the newspaper. News, representative democracy, expertise are all forced to increase their pace. This can produce a catch-22. If these liberal institutions fail or refuse to accelerate adequately, then they are always behind. But if they speed up too much, they abandon their original purpose, which uh, is to seek out some kinds of grounds of consensual fact. 
As Hartmut Rosa argues in his uh, book, Social Acceleration, the crisis of the 1970s, the shift from Fordism to post-Fordism, was that the state went from being an agent of social acceleration or, or modernization, but Rosa is particularly interested in this notion of acceleration, to becoming viewed as a break on it, to be circumvented or broken up. But to grasp what is truly novel about the digital public sphere, we cannot simply view these term shifts in terms of acceleration, I would argue. The turn from an idealization of facts to an idealization of real-time data alters the political logic of democracy and public argument in crucial ways that arguably reduces the very need for trust, let alone consensus. What emerges instead is a kind of non-representational public sphere that might best be conceived as a hybrid of warfare and markets, a discursive fear that operates as a kind of constant rolling referendum, but never generating any kind of result or conclusion. As screens have moved from their military origins via financial markets into civil society, they helped configure a new form of subjectivity that is primed for reaction rather than as imagined in the liberal public sphere for observation uh, or uh, critique. This type of public sphere, if that's what it even is, was anticipated and I would argue even advocated for by neoliberal intellectuals dating back to the 1920s. Again, I think the, the, the significance of neoliberalism is important here. On the pessimistic grounds, the liberal representative democracy was opening the door to socialism and then totalitarianism. The desire, as far as they were concerned, to create a portrait of society was itself dangerous. Representative democracy was deemed vulnerable to the lure of socialist parties expert representations of society in the form of statistics or sociological facts was vulnerable to the lure of scientism, which assumes the existence of fixed laws of social change. Um, Marx was obviously the kind of big bogeyman, but uh, someone like Durkheim would have been uh, almost as, as terrifying to them. The virtue of the market from the neoliberal perspective is a technology of something like direct democracy, a democracy without liberal instruments of representation or consensus and without the friction of bureaucracy or legislators. In the hands of the early neoliberals, the market becomes one more information technology through which human activity can be coordinated over distances and in real time. This is the important thing. What's more, unlike the restricted democracy of bourgeois liberalism, the market has the considerable populist benefit of being open to all. Where the liberal public only included the bourgeois minority, neoliberalism would ostensibly would claim to do away with class altogether by treating everyone as a capitalist, liberating them to take on debts and acquire assets. Uh, it delivered uh, certainly on the first part of the, of the, of the promise. This would be a central part of the political narrative, the populist, market populist narrative accompanying Thatcherism and Reaganism in the 1980s. Ludwig von Mises, for example, in his opening contribution to the socialist calculation debate of the 1920s, treats the price system as the only viable means of mediating between conflicting social values across a diverse modern society. Really, the market then is a democratic machine and not just a welfare enhancing one. The case for the market in, the, in that debate is not just that it is not that it is, is not that it is the only form of rationality, but the only form of rationality that can be performed at scale in real time in a society of conflicting values, that there is no alternative to it, uh, given the need for calculation to occur in real time. And in his famous paper on the use of knowledge in society, Friedrich von Hayek uh, uh, argues, this is, I think, a, a fascinating quote. It is more than a metaphor, I put that in highlights because I think it's significant, it is more than a metaphor to describe the price system as a kind of machinery for registering change, or a system of telecommunications which enables individual producers to watch merely the movements of a few pointers, as an engineer might watch the hands of a few dials in order to adjust their activities to changes of which they may never know more than is reflected in the price movement. And during the 1950s, Gary Becker made this the political, the quasi-democratic program of neoliberalism explicit, arguing there is relatively little to choose between an ideal free enterprise system and an ideal political democracy. Both are efficient and responsive to the preferences of the electorate. And again, I, I've highlighted efficient and responsive because I think it's quite telling that efficiency and responsiveness uh, are treated as being the obvious um, uh, virtues of democracy. And uh, according by those criteria, of course, the market is eventually going to outperform. It's not just speed and scope that elevates the market above liberal democracy, but the precision of its language, namely prices. The Hobbesian fear of rhetorical excess is here dealt with through the disciplinary power of monetary calculations. 
markets actually force people to speak numerically or interact numerically. Markets from this kind of perspective are permanent rolling audits of sentiment, opinion, and taste expressed in monetary terms. You don't need the liberal public sphere if you've got, if you've got markets. The neoliberal version of the public sphere does not emerge out of a rarefied set of merchant communities or spaces of market exchange as it had in the late 17th century. The market is the public sphere, only now the market is to be valued not because of how it facilitates trust between strangers, as um, it would be for, for Smith or, 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 or others, but for the speed and precision with which it captures and transmits information and sentiment. If you'll forgive the anachronism, what the neoliberals were really imagining was that the market be treated as the platform on which political, social, and economic life could be conducted. Like any other telecom network or computer, this platform needed carefully designing, tweaking, and fixing from time to time, and potentially needed policing by the state, or, or maybe policing by its private owners in the case of uh, various forms of platform-based market. But so long as it was carefully maintained, it offered a form of society that no longer depended on trust in political or scientific elites, and in which every voice was heard via consumer and investor choice. We might therefore see the giant digital platforms in the early 21st century, not as a departure from the neoliberal project of the 20th century, but as its fulfillment, a fantasy of replacing public government staffed by experts authorized by legislators with an infrastructure of real-time data capture, which is evidently alive and well in Silicon Valley, a fantasy of bypassing trust-based liberal instruments such as fiat money inspires libertarian projects such as cryptocurrencies, which ostensibly have no dependence on law or paper. From the strict neoliberal or libertarian perspective, the apparent liberal crisis of trust, which I, I started out discussing, might be viewed as evidence of political progress. What 21st century platforms have added to the existing apparatus of the neoliberal market are various additional mechanisms of rating, reaction, and reputation, all of which supplement the price mechanism. These include instruments ostensibly aimed at generating trust, such as recommendation and reputation systems, but these do not function in the manner of a promise committed to paper, which might be used, for instance, if someone was to default. Instead, they are mechanisms which function to the extent that they are ungameable, but which in doing so keep alive the fear that one is being gamed, producing a hunger for more such mechanisms, resulting in a kind of arms race of mutual rating and surveillance. I just want to identify two uh, final ways in which this platform-based public sphere differs from the liberal public sphere that I outlined earlier, um, and then I'll offer some uh, concluding remarks. The first concerns what John Maynard Keynes referred to as animal spirits, but which we might also think of as speculative economies of esteem. The ideal participant, and I stress idealized participant in the bourgeois public sphere, was a type of critic or judge who makes a disinterested assessment on the basis of critical distance. By contrast, the ideal participant in the digital public sphere is closer to the Clausewitzian general, constantly detecting and reacting to the latest contingency. Under these conditions, questions are increasingly posed in binary terms, buy or sell, long or short, like or unlike, swipe left or swipe right, like the worm that accompanies televised presidential debates offering a real-time indication of positive or negative reactions. Today, we are surrounded by interfaces of various kinds that effectively pose a simple question to praise or to denounce. As cyberneticians understood, when one is in the flow of chaotic experiences, feedback is most easily reduced to keep it like this or change it. In platform-based scenarios of which financial markets are really the forerunner, everyone also has the chance to watch how others are allocating their esteem which is where why they suffer from financial spirits, according to animal spirits, according to Keynes. Are they buying or selling that stock? How many likes does that video have? People like you also liked X. A central function of those Bloomberg screens is to witness when lines that were once heading upwards suddenly turn downwards. Just as this logic generates volatility in financial markets, it generates reputational volatility in the cultural and political domain. Secondly, this digital public sphere encounters an ever receding horizon of what might count as conclusive proof, precisely because of an ideology that generates so-called raw data. In an age when everything we do is potentially captured on a camera or a screen in some way, 
an epistemological vicious circle occurs in which there is an expectation that photographs or behavioral traces or snippets of text will settle disputes and put them to rest, but no quantity of data is ever adequate to this task. No quantity is ever quite final. Thanks to ubiquitous data capture, it is assumed that we don't need old fashioned witnesses, formal statements, official reports. What this misses is, is not the function of data to settle disputes, but the function of institutions, rules and promises. Thus the phenomenon, which is so common to um, uh, all sorts of media um, arguments and politic, political disputes around the world, the phenomenon of interminable conflicts in which the provision of photographs, video and audio recordings paradoxically seems to fan the flames of conspiracy theories and distrust as manifest in allegations of fakery, that somehow a sort of photograph that should sort of be the final word on something seems to just generate a whole new set of, of arguments. The result of this, as we see on a regular basis in the news, is we have a set of epistemic technologies that are extremely well suited to undermining credibility, but far less suited to building it. Data can be sufficient to demonstrate that someone has broken a promise, that the facts are not quite what they seem, but it is inadequate to serve as a promise of its own. In our everyday lives, for instance, if someone, I mean, something I sort of noticed in my, in my sort of everyday life, if someone sends you photographic proof that they are doing what they promised to do, that often has the perverse effect of making you more suspicious, not less, as if, like, why are you showing me this? Um, hence, transparency in the form of leaks and whistleblowing for all its merits in exposing wrongdoing tends to raise doubts about integrity more broadly. I mean, often for good reason, but nevertheless, it has a kind of institution, institutional disintegration effect. While notoriety can be inflated via these media by a constant stream of incoming reaction, it's less clear, I mean, maybe people know of examples of where this is not the case, but it's less clear how credibility can be uh, constructed. Now, of course, it would be a great mistake to underestimate how powerful platform and mobile technologies have been in triggering and mobilizing movements for social justice, something that has received multiple waves of excitement, uh, particularly in the uh, aftermath of, of the Arab Spring in 2011 and since. Nobody could dispute the fact that real-time coordination, garnering reaction, achieving virality is now integral to how activism and movement building occurs and must occur. The question remains of what sort of institution building are then possible. And for that, I would argue a different type of political logic is required. The transition out of the real-time public sphere, which was uh, back in the 17th century was the function of the paper uh, performed, is a necessary requirement for anything that seeks durability. So just a, a few uh, conclusions. Firstly, just a, a, a brief reflection on social theory and what, what this means from a perspective of social theory. The distinction I've drawn here between facts and data in these kind of ideal typical terms and their associated politics maps somewhat onto some now quite long-standing binaries in social theory between modernity and post-modernity in the work of say Jean-Francois Lyotard or classical modernity and late modernity in the work of Hart Hartmut Rosa and others. Certainly, the digital age feels faster, more fluid than what preceded it, endorsing this kind of diagnosis of, of postmodernity in the work of people like Zygmunt Bauman as well. But more than that, the project of eliminating friction from social relations has inbuilt tendencies, I would suggest, towards conflict, steadily eliminating the temporal interruptions within which mutual understanding and trust can occur. Clausewitz, of course, is most famous for describing war as the continuation of politics with other means. And we might reflect on the fact that we find it much harder today to distinguish politics from war than we might have done 50 years ago. And uh, particularly, this became sort of literally the case in 2016 and the sort of disputes that went on around the elections in 2016 as, as to whether or not uh, that Russia was engaging in forms of cyber war against the United States and Britain and other, other countries and, and had been doing for, for quite some time. The digitization of public discourse also appears to have made it harder to distinguish precisely what we mean by violence. Understanding the present may involve, uh, sorry, I was going to say, sociology in particular has arguably, maybe this is contentious, had an unconscious or conscious Hobbesian bias, seeking to understand why society is as ordered as it is, why it persists, why it doesn't fall apart. Understanding the present may involve inverting some of those presuppositions to understand processes of falling apart and the imminent rationality of disruption. It's not just an absence of rationality when these things happen. There is a, there is a rationality to them. It's a different one. Secondly, where do universities and social scientists stand in all of this? We're not external to the epistemological, technological, and political transformations I've mapped here. 
For one thing, social scientists are, whether we like it or not, in some sense inheritors of the 17th century liberal legacy with all of the racial, gendered, and class-based forms of injustice and exclusion that allowed those early expert communities uh, to be established or which they established themselves upon. We absolutely must not unthinkingly celebrate it, which is what you see in certain corners of the, of the right in the form of uh, sort of free speech activism and this sort of thing. But nor can we simply pretend, nor can we simply abandon the practices of slow paper-based promise making on which modern scholarship depends. If you take uh, the institution of peer review um, and you see what happens when a troll intervenes in the process in bad faith by submitting bogus data, knowing full well that it will be taken on trust. It's not clear uh, other than to uh, continue uh, taking things on trust, how else scholarship uh, could uh, persist in the way that we understand it. At the same time, we're all under pressure to work faster, uh, the natural sciences to patent quicker, to demonstrate impact, to achieve audience engagement, perhaps even to go viral. Uh, what I've hoped to show here is that eventually there is some basic normative conflict between uh, these two different uh, imperatives. The issue, uh, it seems to me, and maybe we can go back to this, my sort of rather crude encapsulation of, of Hobbes's uh, anthropology, uh, is uh, this still this problem in the digital public sphere where fantasies of pure first-hand experience combined with Klaus Witzian uh, visions of inner truth and courage have this destabilizing effect. And it's not clear, and I think we've seen this from efforts to defeat uh, forms of nationalism and, and, and conserve right-wing populism in recent years, that simply invoking facts is an adequate response to this. And I, I don't pretend to have uh, the, the full, uh, uh, the, the necessary responses at my uh, fingertips. Nevertheless, nothing I've said here should be taken as crudely epochal, as if one set of epistemic equipment has wholesale replaced another. The institutions, instruments, and legacies of liberalism are all around us, even if they are under attack in new ways, often for very good reason. Another question we might consider is how they might be revived and freed from the effect, is how those liberal institutions might be revived and freed from the effects of neoliberalism in various ways. Uh, I'm thinking here partly of, of Wendy Brown's heavily caveated qualified defense of some elements of liberal institutions in, in undoing the demos, at least in as much as they make space for the political as something um, external to the economic. Dating back to the French Revolution, elements of the radical liberal tradition involve pushing normative claims and rights into the sphere of the economy using law, such as corporate governance reform, new property rights, uh, income guarantees. And uh, for that reason, uh, are now more often adopted by democratic socialists, um, for instance, uh, as seen in something like the Real Utopias project of, of Eric Olin Wright. The capacity of law to operate independently of economics seems like a basic requirement if political sovereignty is ever to challenge the sovereignty that has been handed out to financial and platform actors. And I'm sure there are all sorts of lawyers who could comment uh, with far more authority than I could on, 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 on what uh, a sort of non-efficiency oriented uh, form of regulatory intervention in, in platforms um, and the financial sector uh, might look like. Epistemologically, a radical liberal tradition persists in the form of radical statistics, which deploys the armory of the modern fact, previous term, to disrupt dominant ideologies and challenge national exceptionalism laboriously counting and measuring things that otherwise go uncounted and unmeasured remains a potentially radical world-changing activity or what Isabel Bruno and her colleagues have termed stat activism. Piketty's work is testimony to the power of a liberal imagination to construct new types of macro objectivity that challenge dominant assumptions. I recommend uh, Mike Savage's new book, The Return of Inequality about uh, the, the, the appearance of what he calls an inequality paradigm from 2011 onwards and how it has uh, had all sorts of effects uh, well beyond the study of, of, of inequality in terms of how different problems of, about history and, and, and time are considered. One of the big questions coming out of the pandemic is the extent to which it will strengthen an epidemiological, possibly even a sociological governmentality or merely antagonize the political forces pitted against it, possibly both. Very finally, um, I've obviously emphasized the potential of real-time data to generate disruption and conflict through processes of acceleration. But technological change, I'm not, uh, I may be a bit of a Luddite, but I'm not, I'm not naive to think that these, these things are good, these genies are gonna go back in the bottle. Nor can we ignore the need for early warning systems and information infrastructures in protecting people from threats such as pandemics and climatic events. If we feel like we are in a hurry right now and want to eradicate friction, there are plenty of good reasons why that is the case. 
Campaigns such as climate mobilization aimed at harnessing the wartime powers of the state in the services of decarbonization have a fiscal logic, but they also have a political, ecological, and affective logic in speaking to a sense of time running out. At certain times and in certain places, the pandemic has illustrated possibilities of what non-violent mobilizations might look like in the uh, form of mutual aid, emergency care provision, and mass mobilization of public health infrastructures. The uh, modern infrastructural ideal that was steadily undone through forms of privatization and platformization from the 1980s onwards has occasionally flickered back into life over the last two years with, uh, I, I haven't followed the whole issues to do with the Biden's infrastructure bill, but I, the, the intriguing innovation in the US, uh, which I wonder if it will spread elsewhere, of uh, classifying care uh, as a form of infrastructure on which society and economy depend uh, as an alternative to uh, a sort of logic of, 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 private, of infrastructural privatization and platformization. UK government's proudest achievement over the past two years, which saw its polling numbers surge, they're not actually its trust levels, was the very successful vaccine rollout of this time last year, which was one of the fastest and best targeted in the world. This real-time military-style strategy was achieved through advanced forms of data analytics, sweeping up data from the National Health Service in the process, which is extremely rich data, incidentally, to eliminate friction. Uh, the company that performed this feat, gobbling the data and achieved, delivering this great success, was Palantir, <laughs> which uh, the question then I want to end with is, is that what the future of good uh, and effective government uh, can only look like? So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Will, for this really uh, wonderful uh, lecture. So do we have questions? Yes. Uh... All right, maybe I should start. So I, I worked for Palantir for a while uh, and, and I'm also a lawyer. And so uh, I want to pick up on the interesting provocation about what would a legal intervention look like? Yeah. Uh, drawing a little bit from my experience uh, at Palantir and also a bit on my uh, of my experience as a lawyer. Um, and I think that there are actually two ways that you could that just immediately come to mind. First, uh, I'll relay a quick like example from my Palantir days. We worked for a German insurance company uh, where we replaced their paper assessment system for cases that came before them with a very frictionless, a uh, sleek, modern computer-based system that allowed them to um, do 10 times as many insurance cases a day than they were before. After about three months of deploying the system, um, the employees at these German, the assessors at this German insurance company came back and they said, we hate it. And we asked why. And they said, well, we really liked doing fewer cases on paper. <laughs> and the reason why is that we liked inhabiting the story of these horrible accidents and other mishaps that came before them. They liked inhabiting the mind space and the story and the setting of uh, these things that came before them. And so we, we responded with like, okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually put a deliberate throttle on the system. Mm -hmm. We're gonna make it uh, harder. We're gonna put time like timers. So you have to spend a certain amount of time with certain cases. Uh, but most importantly, we're gonna put a picture of the person who is filing the case in the interface itself. So you can look at a face <laughs> while, while, you're, while you're doing this. So, I, so one thing I thought of uh, immediately is um, the law can simply regulate uh, user design and interface aspects of this. Now, is that as good as doing things on paper? I, I don't think so. Um, and, and I think that it um, can very easily get to a point where we're back where we started. Um, so despite the fact that maybe we can regulate certain aspects of the user interface, which by the way, is the thing that's come up with regards to Facebook and social media with people wanting to regulate how these interfaces say, um, interact with uh, people or you know, young users. Um, I think that's one way. The other way that I think is interesting is the law could introduce a type of sectoral bargaining for users of platform economies. Uh, an example of that is um, the law can uh, empower, uh, much in the same way that it empowers unions in America to negotiate with their employers, the law can empower people who say uh, sell things on Amazon in the third party marketplace. Um, ironically, at least in the Amazon case, when uh, 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 people who are selling on Amazon organized 
they actually organized to make Amazon more friction free. In other words, they organized so that every product got the buy now button. Um, whereas previously only certain products would get the buy now button and only and other products won't, depending on how much uh, of a concession that third party was willing to make on their product uh, as a discount when they sell on Amazon. Um, so that's that's an idea. Um, but I I'm I'm curious to know what you what you think. Um, and I'm also just curious as to like, you know, the 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 retort I think is that tech companies will simply say, oh, we got it. We will find a way to use technology to reintroduce the friction. Yeah. So no big deal. Sure. We'll just find another technologically based solution. So I was curious as to what you yeah. think of that. Can, can I ask one question? You said you said you don't think it's as good as doing things on paper in your in your discussion of Palantir. What what why is that? Given you were you worked for Palantir, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm sort of I, I thought you were I thought you were point leading up to saying that what I was saying was hopelessly naive and sort of nostalgic for something that is sort of utterly gone. Whereas you then seem to sort of agree with some of of, 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 of the critique. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was going to go that way, <laughs> I, I'll admit. Uh, and then I thought about it for a second. And, um, and, and this is really not based on a sort of empirical social science. I, I haven't seen much of this, but I'll say that at least in my own experience, uh, there's a material, warm, aesthetic quality of paper that I think um, kind of has a form of... Uh, you know, combustion with um, the emotional and spiritual aspect of the work that we do. So maybe I'm like yeah. an old school believer in like the Marxist idea of not being separated from our species being and like our labor being an expression of ourselves. But well, like, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't mean to get too romantic about the kind of materiality itself. It was more just that sort of when you're talking about technologies of, of trust, um, that, uh, that what I was trying to draw attention to was that there was this very fertile moment in the development of these kind of paper-based promise-making uh, institutions. Um, and that uh, the, uh, no doubt, of course, there are various technologies that present themselves as bases for trust. And, and after all, something like Bitcoin is, is in some sense sort of offering a, 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 some kind of trust-based, or there's some sense that you can, whether it's trust or something else, I don't you know exactly where we define the, what trust is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, that the, the question of how words can be uh, turned into some kind of form where they uh, are trusted to remain static and can't be sort of interfered with or, and, and won't be interfered with it is a sort of sociological and political uh, problem uh, that can't just simply be sort of, you know, disrupted and re-engineered and uh, sort of solved through some kind of algorithmic uh, mentality. And I suppose part of what I was also trying to get at was that if you take something like the law and economics tradition, it really is an attempt in some ways to kind of replace law with algorithm in the sense that you, know, you look at antitrust cases under the influence of of law and economics movement, and effectively they turn their battles between um, between government economists. I mean, not ex entirely. I mean, but nevertheless, you get these highly complicated cases uh, between one side of where, where economists are sort of bringing models into the courtroom, and, and often the judge doesn't really understand what the hell is, is, they're, they're, they're seeing because the economics is so complex. Uh, so it turns into a kind of algorithmic arms race, but 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 sort of housed in 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 the courtroom. Um, I'm not quite sure I've slightly gone off the topic, but uh, um, I, I mean, I appreciate your, your comments because it's, 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 I mean, to be a lawyer who's also worked at Palantir is, uh, you, you, you've sort of, um, you, I couldn't have a, a more sort of relevant <laughs> kind of commentator on what I've been talking about. So thank you. Definitely history is worth that. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, that was, general, yeah. Um, that was absolutely fantastic, and I loved um, the way in which you provide um, this juxtaposition between a, 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 the epistemology of a certain type of fact, you know, um, based upon forms of expertise that we're meant to trust in, and this shift to um, the data land, you know, where which is based entirely not about distance and objectivity, but about speed and contingency. But I guess the thing that I want to push you on a little bit, and I'm a, I'm a historian, so it's going to be a, <laughs> coming from that direction, is what's involved? What are the agents involved in that type of shift? And so I'm going to go back to the beginning of your talk to, to, to think this through. 
I'm not sure what trust is. Mm -hmm. And actually, I'm not that sure that you're that sure about what <laughs> trust is. Um, but the forms of knowledge and the forms of what you call trust that developed in the 18th century happened, obviously, in a profoundly anti-democratic environment. Mm, sure. yeah? Yeah. They emerged, and Poove is very good on this, that this is about form, new forms of statecraft that mm. Foucault would come to call biopolitics and new forms of capitalism, not least financial mm. capitalism, which is why the Bank of England is at the beginning of your talk. And yet then what happens is that we have this theory of trust and expertise in your story, which is about liberalism mm. and, and about forms of, of um, political community where we can, um, where we can have faith in, in, in those who represent us, not even necessarily the state. Mm. Yes. So I guess the question, this is a long winded way of saying so, so if I'm a little suspicious in your version of liberalism as being having not saying a whole lot about capitalism and mm. forms of statecraft in the 18th century, what's the shift in the, I'm not sure when it happens for you, but let's say the 60s to the 1990s or the 2000s that sees the disintegration mm. of those forms of, of trust in, in a certain type of knowledge Mm. to this new data land yeah, where sure. it all disintegrates. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, it's a fair point. I, I mean, I, I hope I, I, I was alert to the sort of the, the, the high exclusivity of these of these liberal communities um, and how, you know, as I said, that they myopically believed themselves to be sort of representing humanity. I mean, it was sort of, which is ridiculous. And uh, we, now we can look back and, and see it as, 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 as somewhat absurd, really. But, um, but no, and, and certainly liberalism and democracy do not have to go together. So we, we, I mean, that, that much is clear. Um, and of course, there's a whole story about capitalism. Um, this could sort of, you know, um, yes, uh, the, you know, uh, 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 and the financial communities. And of course, a lot of the, you know, the newspapers, the Times newspaper, and these sorts of things were primarily aimed at merchants, providing them with the information that they needed and so on. So there was a particular forms of epistemic requirement. Um, in terms of the sort of historical shift, I mean, so, uh, and I'm not a historian, so, um, uh, I mean, there's something happens after the First World War of, of the expansion of the franchise um, and uh, the fear of mass society, which is at the heart of neoliberal uh, critiques of representative democracy, the fear that the mob have now got the vote, um, which was uh, really animated the auto liberals and the Austrians and so on, um, and no doubt was also, I mean, as Melinda Cooper's book, uh, Family Values, shows how you know the the American neoliberals were fearful of of the civil what the civil rights movement meant in a, in a similar way that well the we better have the market because the alternative is actual political enfranchisement so we'll have this form of democracy which is not really democracy instead um, so there's there's, there's the first world war which of course also introduces the whole problem of real time calculation um, because. Um, effectively, I mean, the socialist calculation debate I alluded to, Otto Neurath said, well, if we can plan military conflict in real time using statistics and tables and so on, um, why can't we do the same thing for public ownership of the means of production? Why can't we have a, a, a planned economy? If we can plan a war, why can't we have a planned economy? And that, that, that argument was provoked the uh, you know me von Mises and others into making these responses about well actually only the market is a is a is a is an adequate computer and 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 that, that. Um, in terms of what happens with the sixties and seventies I mean this I mean this has been you know there are there are there are others who would would be able to talk more about this but yeah, there's a whole story about the loss of 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 of, of sovereignty of the Keynesian state in the nineteen sixties to do with things like the you know the euro dollars and the uh, the, the 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 digitization of uh, of of currency markets in the late 1960s as representing a profound challenge to the very possibility of of of, of any form of economic sovereignty of the of the Keynesian state. Um, so uh, again, I mean, there are history. I'm sure there are endless histories about that. But you know what led up to the collapse of Bretton Woods as a combination of digitization and the offshoring of financial trading seems to be the seems to be a kind of pivotal issue. But um, and then of course there's a there's a parallel story of you know people like Paul Edwards and others have have, have told of of the development of the computer. You know, IBM, MIT, 
the confluence of the American Cold War state and um, big business. And, and I mean, again, that's a quite a, a well-told historical story that others know better than me. But I mean, those are my sort of uh, non-historians uh, responses on that. I had a sort of a similar question. I have a, an idea for you. Mm -hmm. There was a study, I apologize, I don't remember exactly when and where, it was about 10 years ago, about the accuracy of the Wikipedia versus the accuracy of Encyclopedia Britannica. And uh, I think it would be very good to, to consider including, the conclusion is that they're roughly equally accurate with okay. completely different types of errors. Okay. One primarily errors of recency, the other primarily errors in fact. Um, and it's, it's interesting to think about that. But I was also going to make a sort of a similar challenge, um, which was that the idea that the that the mob was dangerous has been around since Socrates was executed yeah. or not executed, you know, was was to be executed. Jesus flipped over the money changers tables, there was this conflation of the political uh, sovereignty and the market and its importance, even at, you know, thousands of years ago, why did Roman emperors mint coins to express mm -hmm. their sovereignty. And so I, I'm struggling to understand, kind of, I think in a similar vein to the previous question, at what point do you think that this hap, you know, change occurred? And I'm, I'm struggling to understand how neoliberalism, which is you know, kind of something that even the origins of which only go back a couple hundred years, really, um, trying to understand how that is responsible. I, I see people who, are, who don't believe in a lot of neoliberal ideas also questioning books mm. in revisionist history saying social justice can't proceed until we burn the old books right, right and change the narrative so I, I'm, I'm sort of struggling to understand how that neoliberalism has such a prominent role in that change that seems to be a long-standing historical trend with sort of many origins right yeah i mean yeah, thank you, and uh, thanks for the, the uh, uh, that that paper on Wikipedia and encyclopedias is, is, is a is a is a perfect encapsulation of something that I'm trying to get at. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I, you know, obviously you can you can sort of the the question of 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 technologies of 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 threat prevention. I'm sure you know dates back earlier than. Napoleon, you know, so um, obviously societies throughout uh, history have, have have struggled with with these questions of, of promise keeping, these anthropological questions of promise keeping um, and, um, uh, and 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 threat detection and reaction, uh, which is in some ways sort of Hobbes's kind of kind of trans historical point is that all human beings in, in all times and places have had to start struggle with these kinds of these kinds of issues. Um, I suppose to go back i mean you know so there's i mean there, i'm not sure i have quite an adequate response to you other than to sort of reiterate some of the the, the the points that i was trying to make which was that the question of uh, real time uh, calculation and the question of uh, in some ways what the 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 um you know what 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 arises with neoliberalism is this attempt to establish a kind of a populace that is all plugged into a into this kind of real-time computer of, of some kind or another, which in some ways is the the, the kind of model of of, of, of a, of a platform-based public sphere. That was the argument I made. Um, technologically, this was not considered to be um, viable. Um, you know, even as recently as the 19th century, most people weren't were not plugged in. Um, I think that the uh, rise of uh, digital financial markets, which was what I was just referring to, uh, particularly from the 1960s onwards, becomes a sort of uh, an opportunity to realize uh, Hayek's vision of a kind of telecom network, of, of a market which is actually a telecom network. Uh, the, the, the digital financial market, as exhibited by the kind of Bloomberg screen, um, is the uh, sort of materialization of something that, that, that so Hayek appears to sort of intuit is coming in some ways, um, but you know, with with the addition of it being a some sort of answer to the problem of mass democracy, which is also only a, a problem that that arises in the in the, really in the twentieth century or in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century. So, I mean, of course, yes, Socrates was uh, in the, the problem of the mob um, has you know, no doubt received various kind of manifestations and representations over time, but I'm not sure how well I've answered your question, but I think obviously there are sort of sociological specificities. Yeah, 
calculation problem. Mm. And the, the possibility of solving the calculation mm. problem is what led to this yeah. new thing that yeah. now has kind of got run up. Sure. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So I see still a few questions. We also have one online, but we are taking one last question because we are running sure. out of time. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I was just wondering, uh, I was just curious if you could clarify a bit the sort of distinction that you drew at the beginning, the sort of um, fact data sort of paper Bloomberg terminal or a like blue terminal kind of distinction, because to m just anecdotally based on my own experience of the internet growing up, it seems like there's a lot of things that seem to be kind of a, that seem to be hybrid between hmm. the binary that you drew. So like Wikipedia, feels like an example of that where the wikipedia article is ostensibly static but it is constantly edited right in response to developments so that you know somebody can be announced to be dead and suddenly the the dates mm. on their page are changed or, right you know for instance like mechanical turk yeah or people who work on mechanical turk are generating data oftentimes for researchers that then gets turned into an article which is static and so mm. i was i'm not sure i fully grasped the kind of fact data distinction right. that you were working with and i was wondering if you could clarify it yeah more. i mean <laughs> i mean these are good these are these are good sort of criticisms of the of the of the framework actually i mean it's not maybe that you didn't grasp it i think you're kind of pointing out this issue of hybridity i mean i think sort of begins to kind of problematize this as i said was a kind of ideal typical kind of um uh, sort of uh, um attempt to 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 distinguish between um uh, I mean, in a sense, it's a pragmatist argument, right? So it's rather than think about is this knowledge true, think about what what is what is what are, what are knowledge claims and knowledge devices doing? What are they what do they do socially and politically? Um, and the distinction is between the type of knowledge that is accompanied uh, that, that, that that serves the social function of um, anchoring promises and uh, sustaining trust, whether I understand trust is a going back to uh, the, the previous question is a, 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 another matter, but I mean, there are interesting sort of pragmatist questions about the nature of promises and the nature of, of trust in that respect. And there's something quite sort of mysterious, I think, potentially going on there um, versus um, forms of knowledge and technologies of knowledge, which um, purport to um, uh, to, 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 to keep one up to speed and not to fall behind and to retain some kind of competitive advantage. Um, and um, a, a form of knowledge which is against a backdrop of constant flux, which again, incidentally, someone like you know, Hayek um, believed that markets were uniquely able to capture and collect knowledge that is constantly um, changing in a way that social scientists cannot. Social scientists are, are trapped by their sort of static technologies. Markets um, have this kind of dynamism uh, that they are always uh, up to speed. Now, your, your point about Wikipedia, and this is interesting, this has come up now a couple of times. I, I just, that's a very interesting question about the extent to which Wikipedia has the function of being a kind of testimony in a way, because uh, that's what is needed. And to go back to where I kind of ended, which was to say, you know, that endlessly receding horizons of proof that data, raw data never settles an argument precisely, you know, and I sort of what I was discussing. But the interesting thing about Wikipedia is, of course, it's the Wikipedia Foundation, and it has various constitutional principles attached to it. It's one of the examples that I was mentioning Eric Olin writes, uh, sort of radical liberalism, Marxism. I mean, Wikipedia is one of his one of his real utopias. Is 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 of, of a uh, you know cooperatively governed. Um, it, it has the uh, qualities of a um, of a kind of liberal institution, and I think that's not irrelevant here. And I think it is interesting because after all, my 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 lecture, I guess, is quite pessimistic. And I think that the, um, the you know, this is an example maybe of where a form of a, a form of optimism lies is in how do you start to kind of bring these things back together? And that might be for the for, for another for another project. And of course, there are things like, you know, platform cooperativism and, uh, and, and um, uh, efforts to try to take uh, some of these tools and, and embed them in legal frameworks, which again, kind of comes back a little bit to the, to the discussion from the uh, 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 colleague earlier. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, what what some of the, you know, I think what your point is, I don't think it's you didn't understand me. I think it's that you've you, you've 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 well highlighted a, an area where some some more kind of uh, discussion is is required. 
Okay, well, uh, this is actually on, on this slightly more optimistic note, you know, that's the perfect place to end. So thank you very much for being here with us. And uh, thank you thank to you the audience much. online as well.